We want to turn to the word of the Lord this morning. Just a, a, a simple message, one you've probably heard before, but uh, I know that this is God's word for us this morning. I knew this was going to be a busy time, and I knew Pastor Renee was going to be gone, and um, I, I didn't know that I wouldn't have a computer or any access of any sort, but the Lord knew that, and, and even last week He began putting in my heart the verses and the thoughts and the scriptures, and then and, and impressed to my heart early this week um, that this is what we'd be looking at today, and this is what I'd be talking about today. Um, because God loves us so much. He really cares about you and He cares about your life. This is not about a pastor or about a preacher. God brings His Word because He loves us individually. He knows what's going on in our lives and He wants us to be helped and He wants us to be strengthened and He wants us to receive what we need to live, to live life here on this earth and to make and to overcome and to be victorious. So we're going to turn this morning to a very well-known passage I'll, I'll begin it, and I know you'll finish it. They that wait upon the Lord. There you go. You know that passage. Shall renew their strength. Believe me, in these last few weeks, I have been, uh, I've been quoting it over and, and praying it over and over again during the move, and we're getting ready for the summer camp. But as I was preparing, the Lord really opened my eyes to look at the larger passage that this is, of which this is a part. And <coughs> we always jump to, if this is uh, Isaiah chapter 40. So if you have your Bibles or your, or your electronic Bibles, thank you, Ida. You can turn there. The verse that we have memorized is the very last one. It's verse 31. Those who, and this is a New Living Translation. We're going to look at NIV and some others as well. And we're going to go back and forth between them, but we know it quite well. We always jump to verse 31. And that's, when we look at this passage, that's the verse we like, isn't it? That's the verse that this is the promise of God. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We sing songs about this. How many of you know the song? You have to be an old Christian to know that song. Do you know it? They that wait upon the Lord. Oh, we're all old Christians. We know it, don't we? <laughs> okay. Um, and this is what we jump to. But what I want us to look at this morning is this. And that is that God has given us a larger context for this promise that we hold on to. And in the larger context and in the larger picture, there's even more there that will bless us and help us this morning. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. And we're going to begin somewhere around verse 25 or 26. And if you haven't read this whole psalm before, I challenge you, this week you go back and read, it's not a psalm, sorry, it's a chapter because we're in Isaiah. Go back and read the whole chapter of Isaiah 40. You know, when Isaiah was inspired to write this, it was a tough time for the Jewish people. It, this was hard. And he writes this wonderful, inspired to write this wonderful passage about God and the promises of God to each one of us. And so I, I challenge you, go back and read the whole chapter. We're going to look at part of it today. And here we have in the New Living, and then we'll look at some other ones as well. Um, the different Bible translations, uh, put different verses together. New Living puts it beginning in verse 26. And this is the word, these are the words of God, um, the, the inspiration of God through Isaiah. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. So we begin this context, this section, with a very great view, don't we? It's a very, it's a huge picture. And sometimes when we come to something like this, we feel very small, don't we? Here's this great passage about the stars of heaven. He brings them out. And here we are, small and little, and we feel like I'm almost not part of it. This is all about God and how great God is. And what I want us to look at and, and understand as we look at this is it begins with a great God indeed, but God is, is starting us there because He wants to get us to this bottom part, which is those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. And so He starts where we should start. You've got to start with God. 
We have to get that perspective right because when our perspective of God is right, when our focus of God is right, then everything else in our lives that we feel, it's big, it's big to me, or we feel it's small, it's unimportant, everything else will then begin to come into the right perspective according to God. So we get our eyes on Him, and then everything else gets in the right place. So God starts off, God, the Holy Spirit inspires Isaiah to write this with this great, great view, but that's not where He's ending, because He ends with us, and what this great view of God is going to mean to you and to me in our lives. That's really what He's doing here. So we want to follow through, we want to follow along as we look at this, uh, as we look at this passage. And as we look at this, look for just a minute at verse 27, um, because in the middle of all this, uh, here's this great view of God, here's this wonderful promise at the end, and plopped into the middle is this complaint as well. Do you see where the complaint is? What verse? Verse 27, okay. And look at the complaint. The complaint is... Oh, Jacob, there, there's a complaint. How can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? So I want to focus on that just a minute. Then we're going to go back up to the top again because it's Jacob and Israel and they're saying, Oh, God, you haven't seen me. Oh, God, you've seen me and you're ignoring me. This is, these are the two parts of this, this complaint. And I want us to look at something here because these are not sinful nations. These are not heathen nations that are complaining. Who's complaining? Verse 27. Who? God's people. God's people, God's people are complaining. And when we look at that, we say, oh yeah, because we're God's people too. And if we're really honest with God, and we always should be, then we get to that. We complain too, don't we, sometimes? Yes? We don't always want people to know, but in our hearts, we start grumbling, don't we? We really do. When things happen to us that we don't understand, God, I don't understand this. I would have done something differently. When tragedy strikes, in our hearts sometimes we say, God, this did not have to happen. You were powerful enough to keep this from happening. We were praying for Sister Ami's brother and the family this week. And I was talking with her before the service. Can you imagine the heartache and the questions in their hearts now? God could have kept him from drowning. God could have stopped. God, why didn't you do that? Why didn't you do that? And we have these questions. God, I don't understand. Or we go through things that wear us out and that tire us out. And when we do, or we struggle with sickness for a long time, as Brother Roy is, um, ongoing, and maybe Susan, and maybe some other ones as well. And we pray and we, we think, God, I have faith. God, I'm serving you. Why aren't you doing something about it? And our hearts begin to get heavy, and we get tired, don't we? And it's not a physical tired, it's a spiritual tired. And we say, as Israel and Jacob say, Lord, you don't see my trouble. And that complaint is, there's so much going on, there's so much out there, God, you don't even see me. I am unimportant to you, you don't see me. But the complaint gets stronger and it gets worse, because the second part of the complaint is what? How can you say God ignores your rights? That's even worse. And that's saying to God, God, you see and you don't care. That, that's what the second part is. You can look at other translations, but that's what it means. God, I know God knows what's going on, and He still hasn't done anything about it. You don't care about me. And so we have this complaint in the middle. Then we go up to the top again, and God's going to answer that. God, God's going to answer that feeling and those questions in our heart. And the, the thing that, God, why? And God, I'm so tired. God, calling out to God when it seems there's not an answer. God answers that for us this morning in this passage. And it begins, look up into the heavens, who created all the stars? Sister Letty? Who created all the stars? God did. Now, you know why I asked Letty that question? If you're in the first service, don't say anything. Why am I asking Sister Letty, who created all the stars? Because, if you didn't know it, Letty is a stargazer, aren't you? That's right. You have a question about stars, you go ask Letty. She will tell you. Now, I'll tell you another secret that I told the first service. Do you know how Letty met her husband? <laughs> Through stargazing. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, maybe you should pick up a new hobby. 
<laughs> they met through stargazing. Uh, was it a trip to Taiwan or no? Inner Mongolia. Inner Mongolia. Ah, oh. Mongol. Okay. <laughs> so Letty's, Letty, we're going to talk about stars this morning, and I'll bet Letty can tell me more than I can tell you. Can tell us more. Um, so. Letty said, God created the stars, and it's true, he did. So God created these stars, and the writer says, look up into the heavens who created all the stars. He brings them out like a, an army. Other translations say like a host, like a host, one after another, calling each by its names. Now, if we were to ask Letty this morning, Letty could tell us the names of I don't know how many stars, a whole bunch of them, couldn't you? you no. <laughs> Letty is humble, um, but she could tell us some names of some of the stars. And here we look at this passage, and it tells us that, and, and this is a physical picture. God wants us to understand how he looks at it and how he looks at us. So it's not a perfect parallel, but it helps us to understand. Calling each by its name. And for me, I like to imagine God calling out the stars. You know, as darkness, descend, as darkness falls and we begin to see the brightest stars first, and then the less bright stars, and then the stars that are dimmer as it gets darker and darker and darker. And I can name maybe four stars. That's it, folks. But God can, knows each one of them. God knows every name. So, let's have a little science lesson. Okay, Letty, don't say anything for because she knows the answer, I'm sure. How many stars are there? Um, I looked at, I was looking at a few things this morning and you know if I had a computer I'd have all sorts of uh, I'd have all sorts of uh, tech for you. Do we have a picture Miss Heidi? Did you find one for us of stars? Give us a okay here we go keep this up here for just a little bit here's a picture of, of part of our Milky Way and we'll just let's look at this for a little while as, as we as we think about it. Scientists say that just with your own eyes you can see uh, a few thousand stars. No telescope, no binocular, nothing. You can see a few thousand stars here in Hong Kong when it gets really dark. So you can see a few thousand. You may say, no, I don't think I can. If your eyes, you, you can see a few thousand. If you could go around the world, southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere, with good eyesight, no telescopes, you could see about 9,000 stars just with your eyes. Then let's get a, go a little bit further. You get a good pair of binoculars. Do you have binoculars, Letty? Yeah. Aha, she has binoculars. <laughs> Letty, with her binoculars, could see about 200,000 stars. Okay? 200,000 stars. But let's not stop there. Do you have a telescope? No, my her husband has a telescope. That would be Kenneth. Okay? <laughs> Kenneth has a telescope. And with a good, a small telescope, do you know what scientists say? you can see about 15 million stars, just with a, a small telescope. But let's not stop there. Large observatories in Hong Kong and other places, large observatories with good telescopes can see billions of stars. Billions, that's a B, okay? But we don't stop there. In our Milky Way, in our Milky Way, in this galaxy, in our Milky Way, scientists estimate that there are 400 billion stars, okay? 400 billion. We've got some mathematicians here this morning, right now, that are going <coughs> right now. They're, think they're thinking, we've got several seated over here. They're thinking that through right now. But we can't stop there. Scientists say that in other galaxies that are just sort of fuzzy patches that we can't really see, can't see so very well, that <coughs> there may be more than a trillion stars and in some of the giant galaxies far away, more than a hundred trillion. How many galaxies? We don't really know, but astronomers guess maybe there are 170 billion. 170 billion, okay? So how many stars is that? They're just guessing. They say this is the observable universe. The observable universe. They say that there are, get a one, and put 24 zeros after it, okay? 24 zeros, they're about that many stars. Okay, uh, yeah. mathematicians, a one with 24 zeros, what word is that? We know it. It is a septillion. Did you know that word? It's new for me. I learned it this morning. Maybe there are a septillion stars. 
in our universe. We got a new word, didn't we, this morning, okay? A septillion, okay. Now you say, Pastor Jennifer, why are we talking about stars so much? Let's talk about why we're talking about stars so much, then we'll keep on going. A septillion stars, God knows every one of them by name. Every one of them by name. And what God wants us to know, and we can put the scripture back up now, Heidi, what God wants us to know is not, is not, oh God, with a septillion stars by name that you know in this observable universe and who knows what else is out there that is unobserved because you're a great God. It is not, oh God, I am nothing, I am nobody, I'm a speck of dust, I'm a speck of dirt that don't, I don't even count. God is saying the reverse. He, is inspi he inspires Isaiah to write this so that you and I would know that with such a God, in such a situation, in such a universe, God says to you and to me, you are not unknown. You are not uncared for. I do see the way that you go. I do care about your, I do care about the path that you go. It is important to me. If I know the name of one septillion stars, one by one by one, and not one of them is lost because of my power and my strength, not a single one is missing. I misplace things. I miss things all the time in 600 square feet. And in God, in His universe, that we can see and that we cannot see. God says not one of them is missing. Not one of them is gone. I know where everyone is. I know where every part is. I know their path. I know everything about them. And in that, your God, your Father says to you and says to me, if I care for that, if I know about that, they're not going to go to heaven or hell. That, that's a piece of dirt. That's a dust speck out there that has no bearing on you or on me. God says, if I know that about them, if my power works on behalf of a, of a star out there that you and I will never know until we get to heaven one day, if I am that type of God, what do you think I feel for you? What do you think I know about you? How do you think I care about you? You think I don't see you? I see you. You think I don't care? I care. You think my strength is not available for you? It is available for you. And that is why this is part of the larger context of this as we look this morning. So have you, can you see, oh, so how can you say, oh God, how can you say, oh God, you don't care? And, and so it's a little bit of a scold, isn't it? It's a little bit of a scold to us this morning. It's in love. It's in love, but it's a little bit of a scold. And then we go on in verse 28. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? Of course we've heard. Of course we've understood. But sometimes we need reminding, don't we? We need, pastors need reminding. We all need reminding of God's care for you, God's love for you, for you in this great world. You see, some of us sitting here this morning, maybe we do quite well. I'm hanging in there. I'm doing all right. My, my place in society is okay. My family is stable. Things are going okay. But I can tell you right now, there's some of us here this morning who are struggling. We are in tough situations. We're in tough circumstances. We may be regarded as nobodies here in this city or in this world, or we are, as there are some of you who are here this morning, who are asylum seekers or refugees, I can tell you, you already know it by experience. Are you highly regarded here? No. It's tough, isn't it? I, I'm, not, I'm not saying something bad. It's something that we know. There are others of us because of our income or the color of our skin or our family backgrounds or our sex, male or female, or for whatever reason, or our past or our history. We are disregarded. We are not acknowledged in general. We've, um, where am, am I loved? Am I worth anything? God is saying in this passage, if you think I care, I, can't, I know about all that you think. I don't know you. I don't care about you. My power is not there for you. It is. It is. And that's what this passage in part tells us this morning. And so there's a little bit of a scold. And he says, the Lord's the everlasting God, the creator of the 
all, of all the earth. Now hang on to these words that come next. He never grows weak or weary. Huh. Why does verse 28 say that? I thought he was talking about stars. Why does he suddenly say that? Hang on. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. You know what that means? It doesn't mean that God's mind, is. that's one of the translations, but the larger meaning here is not that God's mind is too big for you. That's not really what this, that's not the implication here. The implication here, the, the impre, the, the, what it means for you and for me is this. God's understanding and God's mind is so great and infinite that He holds it all together. He brings it all together. It's not hard for Him. You see, you and I, sometimes we have things going on in our lives and we think, God, I don't know how to bring it together. I don't know how to make it fit. Lord, I'm struggling with this and I'm struggling with that. And, and God, how, how many of you have ever said, you look at your life and things that are going on, have you ever sort of cried out almost, Oh God, how is it going to work? Have you ever, have you ever, I have, I really have. God, how is this going to work? And what this impresses on us at this point is that because of God's understanding, it's no problem for Him. He knows how it's going to work. He knows the timing. He knows how it's going to fit together. He knows. We don't, but He does. And then we go on to verse 29. We're going to come back to verse 28. And it says suddenly, He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Wow! We've gone from this great view suddenly all the way down to those who are weak and powerless. That's kind of great, isn't it? We've just been having this great view of God and suddenly He says He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. This is this wonderful passage, or he gives strength to the weary, and he increases the power of the weak. And then we move to verse 30, and I'm, I'm moving quickly because I want us to get all the way through this this morning, and our time is not so long. But we look at verse 30, and ver verse 30 says, even youth will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. Uh, the NIV says, even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. Why does God give us that example right there? Why, why does the Holy Spirit inspire that example? Think about it just a minute. And here is a physical, here's a very natural example we can understand. Let me ask you some questions. Sister Lisa, do you sometimes get tired? Oh yes, she says. Can you go all day long working really hard and not get tired anymore? No. Because you know, Sister Lisa is not a youth anymore. <laughs> and she's never been a young man. We have a natural example plugged in right here so that we can understand. In the natural, who uh, you've met, there's a young man over here you've not met before, but he's going to be part of the camp. His name's Addison, okay? I'll bet you Addison could play games and jump around pretty much all day long and he'd still be good to go, right? He could still keep on going, okay? He could say, why? He's a, he's a youth. He's a young man. And in the natural, those that will last the longest and be the strongest are young men and youth. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. So why does God include this at this point? Because he wants us to understand the physical, natural example and then the spiritual parallel. And here it is. Here it is. The strongest of us, don't worry, he's asking questions. We're glad he's here. Amen. We surely are. Keep going. Keep our focus. So in the natural, the strongest young person, the strongest young man, doesn't matter how strong he is, how many muscles he has, how vigorous he is, at some point he's going to get tired. The strongest, the best. Got it? Take it over to the spiritual now. I don't care how old you are in the Lord. I don't care how mature you are. I don't care how well you've got it all together in your life. I don't care how well you know the Bible from cover to cover. There will be times in your life, there will be times in my life when we will grow tired, when we will feel weak. It is not sin. It is not failure. It is not even lack of faith. It is life. It is life. Every one of us, we will come to that experience. So don't let the devil beat you up 
when that happens in your life. But instead, we look at this passage. And so he says, you're going to become even youth and even young men. They'll fall in exhaustion or they will stumble and fall. But then we come to verse 31. How does it begin? But. Okay. But. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll renew their strength. Now, let's go back and look at a couple words right here. We have some other translations, and I know that you know some other translations. What are some other words or expressions for those who hope in the Lord? Anybody? Those who trust in the Lord. Those who wait. wait. Give me some more words after wait. Those who wait upon the Lord. But there are some other expressions there as well. Those who wait for the Lord. That tells us a little bit more now, doesn't it? Because we get the whole picture. Those who hope in the Lord, those who trust in the Lord, those who wait upon the Lord. And the picture there also is waiting upon the Lord who when we are with Him, we're just with Him and we're gaining strength from Him. That's part of it, right? We're with Him in His presence and we're gaining strength. But that's not all that means. The other part of that expression is those who wait for the Lord. Now, think about that for just a minute. Those who wait for the Lord. Because I'll tell you something this morning. God will never make us wait for Him. God will never tie us down and say, now I'm not going to let you do anything. I'm going to give you my gift of strength. God will not do that because it will be something we have to choose. And so this has all of that meaning, all of that expression. And he says, those that wait for him. And I want us to think about that um, this morning as we come to this last part of the verse. And it helps us to understand those that wait for him. Because you see, every one of us, there are times when we will not wait for the Lord. Yes or no? Yes. We won't wait for the Lord. We pray a little prayer, but our hearts are so anxious and so impatient, we jump in there and we try to do it ourselves, right? And we get all the strength that we have, and we go in there. I'm going to make it happen. How many of you have tried to make something happen before? You bet. Keith raised his hand. Me too, Keith. I have too. We try to make it happen. And brothers and sisters, honestly speaking, that's not waiting for the Lord, is it? And if we try to make something happen that God is going to work out, what happens is we wear ourselves out, we tire ourselves out, we stumble and fall, we grow discouraged, and we won't get it anyhow. We won't make it because there are some things in our lives that only waiting for the Lord will accomplish. That only the Lord can do in our lives. That only God can accomplish. A good example is sitting on the back row of Lighthouse this morning. Keith, who has been waiting for the Lord for work. I told Keith this morning I was going to use his example. I was thinking about him this morning as he was waiting for the Lord. Waiting. And he said, okay, God. And he said, God, by this time, Keith, you know, Keith almost left us. He was waiting for the Lord, but he said, Lord, I'll wait for you. And a job has come through, and it's just come through after a long, long time. But he waited for the Lord. Could he have done something else? Sure, he could have. Could he have tried to make something happen? Sure, he could have. But he waited for the Lord. And when we wait for the Lord, when you wait for the Lord in your life, listen, this is God's word for you this morning. When you wait for for the Lord, whatever you're waiting for now, get into God. When you wait for the Lord, He will do it. He will do it. He will do what you cannot do. Beautiful Old Testament, exa Old Testament example, Abraham, and there are many others, but that's just the one that, that for me was such a strong, God says, I'm going to give you a son. Oh God, great. God, I'm, uh, great. Okay, who? And Abraham gets tired of waiting for God. And what does he do? He makes something happen. What does he make happen? What, is, what was his name? Ishmael. Well, how did that work out? We're struggling with that, with the effects today, aren't we? We're struggling with that today. So what does Abraham do? He waits, then he learns to wait. He waits, he waits. Oh, brothers and sisters, grab this this morning. He waits, he waits, he waits until there is no possibility that he will have the strength and the vitality in his body 
to make something happen. That's waiting for the Lord, brothers and sisters. That's waiting for the Lord. God said, okay, Abraham, you're going to wait because I'm going to do it. It's going to be a miracle child. It's going to be a child of promise. It's going to be something that I do, not something that you make happen. And there are things in your life and in my life that if we will wait for Him and wait upon Him and hope hope for and trust Him for that He will do that will not happen otherwise. And so God helps Abraham to wait until in his body there's no hope of a child being, being brought forth from Abraham's body. There's no hope for a child being brought forth from Sarah's body. God helps them to wait. God helps them to wait. Because when that son came, it came from God. God did it. There was nothing that Abraham could say, look what I did. There was nothing that Sarah could say, <coughs> excuse me, look what I did. It was all, God, you did this. God, you did this. And there are, your things in, there are things in your life and there are things in my life that God wants us to wait on Him and to get strength from Him so that we know God has done it. God has done it. And there won't be any question about it. It will be God's work. <coughs> and that's what this verse is talking about. This is a, Abraham is the perfect Old Testament example. And there are New Testament examples as well. Paul is a wonderful New Testament example when he says, I prayed, oh God, take this thorn out of my flesh. Take it away from me three times. And what does God say to Paul? No. My grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect, complete. These are the other translations. Fulfilled in your weakness. It's great knowing we've got a great, powerful, strong God up there, but there are times when we must have the practical application and working out of this great, powerful God we have in our lives. And this is what happens when we wait for God. Now, look at this verse as we come to a close this morning. And you say, oh, we haven't even gotten to the best part yet. Isn't it great when we look at the Word of God and He gives us all these other good parts that come before that last verse that we thought, we thought verse 31 was the gem of this whole passage, right? There are jewels all the way through. And it says right here, they that wait for the Lord shall, re that's from the ESV, shall renew their strength. Let's talk about this word, renew. Early on it says that God will give strength. But this word renew is a special word and it means exchange. Okay? It means exchange. And so here's the example. Here's the example. Juliet, here we go. <laughs> Juliet's tired. She's weary. She's got a lot of burdens, right? I know she does. <laughs> And she's waiting for the Lord. And her strength is gone, spiritually. Her heart is pressed. Because a lot of times when we deal with things for a long time, it, our, our hearts get weary. It's not a physical weary that sleep can take care of. It's so, deep, so much deeper than that. And so Juliet waits for the Lord. And because she's obedient and she waits for Him, He always, remember Proverbs 30, verse 5, God keeps every promise He makes. He does. And so Juliet waits for the Lord. And what the Lord does is not just, I'm going to give you some strength. What the Lord says is, give me your weakness, your failing, your stumbling. I take that and I give you strength. That's what renew means. Renew means exchange. And when we look at that, then we go back to what I said earlier. I said, hang on to that. What type of strength does God give? What type of strength does He give? Uh, take us back to verse 28. Verse 28, what does it say? He never grows weak or weary. This is the type of strength that God has. It's strength that never gives out. It's, it's not strength. It's not quite enough. It is what is needed. This is the strength that He exchanges your weakness for. He gives you His strength. It's not just a little more of your strength. It's His strength. Yeah? It's His strength. And then when He does that, brothers and sisters, we come to verse 31. This is the part that we've always loved. When God does that, 
This is what happens in our lives. We soar high on wings like eagles. There's this beautiful picture like an eagle. What does an eagle have to do to soar? Almost nothing except put his wings out, right? What does the work? Those warm air currents that come up beneath and the eagle just soars. Don't you? I want to soar. Don't you want to soar? Don't you want to soar all the time? How many of you want to soar like eagles all the time? Thank you. I do too. But guess what? You're not going to soar all the time. You're going to soar sometimes. But you're sometimes going to do what? You're going to sometimes run. And there are times of running in our Christian lives. But you're not going to grow weary when you have the strength of the Lord. And when you start to get weary again, then you're going to go wait for the Lord and have an exchange. Have an exchange. You'll run and not grow weary. Don't you want to, you know there are times of running, but guess what? We don't stop there. Most of the time, brothers and sisters, what do we do in our Christian lives? By the way, and I'm not preaching a discouraging message, because there are some preachers who will say, Oh, sore. Tell you something, if you have a preacher that tells you, you should be jumping from mountaintop to mountaintop, soaring, soaring. Not true. Not so. It's still the Lord's strength. It's still the Lord's victory, but there will be times of soaring, there will be times of running, and most of the time, there will be times of walking. They will walk, we will walk, and we will not faint. We will not faint. This is the Lord's promise for you and for me. And so we wait for Him. Are you struggling with some things this morning? Are you saying, God, I am so tired. I've prayed about this for so long. God, I'm so discouraged. God, I've been trying to so, show grace and love to this person, and I'm so, I'm, I'm, oh, I just want to, mm. Wait for the Lord and receive His strength for your weakness. Receive His love and know that He sees you. He cares about what's going on in your life. And if you will wait for Him, he will give you the exchange, His strength for your weakness. This is His promise. This great God of the septillion stars knows your name, Joan Ann. Knows your name, Ann. Knows your name, Chris. Knows your name, Steve knows your name, Cindy. Let's look to the Lord as we close. Lord, we look to you this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inspiring Isaiah to write this to help us understand what kind of God you are. Not just up there, great and mighty and of the septillion stars, but a great and mighty God for me in my life for each one of us Lord I pray your people this morning every one of us Lord I include myself how I need you how I need your strength oh Lord it's my strength is gone I need your strength I am so weak I need your strength I'm so powerless I need your power to soar to run to walk, to show grace when I, I don't think I can show any more grace, to give forgiveness when, God, I don't think I can forgive them anymore. They've hurt me so many times. I need your strength, oh Lord. I need your strength. And Lord, you've promised, you've promised, you've promised, as we wait for you, and as we wait upon you, and as we hope in you and trust in you, you will renew, you will exchange our weakness for your strength. And we shall soar, we shall run, and we shall walk. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.